Broadcasting from the Bayou City. This is the Power and Market Report, exploring the business of liberty with your host, Albert K. Liu. Against intellectual property. Hello, I'm Albert Liu with guest Stefan Kinsella. Thanks for joining me for another installment of the Power and Market Report, a show about the state, entrepreneurs, and the tireless pursuit of human liberty. Raised in a small town near Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Stephen Kinsella pursued an early interest in the applied sciences at Louisiana State University, where he earned a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering. It was during this period he discovered a passion for legal theory and wasted no time. He received a JD in 1991, LLM in 1992, and has been a registered patent attorney ever since. There is, however, a twist. Mr. Kinsella is also an independent scholar and a leading anti-IP theorist. In his many publications, he makes the case that not only are intellectual property laws unjust, he claims that intellectual property itself does not exist. He joins me today from his home in Houston, Texas. Tell me about, uh, let's pick it up sort of when you were, uh, you know, just before going to college, you, you, right. you went to engineering. I mean, you're, yep, yep, you're yep. adequately degreed, sir. <laughs> yep. I must say you match my MSW and raise me a, a LLM, <laughs> <laughs> a JD and an LLM. So you're certainly adequately degreed, but you must have had a, an interest in, in hard sciences, right? Coming out of high school. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, that was always my interest, just science and, um, of course, philosophy, too. I mean, as a young kid, you know, um, I loved reading the kind of pseudoscience stuff, you know, pyramid power and all that kind of stuff, um, and religion, too. But, yeah, science was always my interest, technology, science. How, you know, I used to take televisions apart and radios apart and all those kinds of things and try to put them back together and figure out their you know, what made them work. I mean. And I'm talking as a young kid. I mean, before I had a systematic knowledge of anything, um, I, I used to get shocked and you know <laughs> hurt and all that kind of stuff. So when it came time to go to college, I just assumed I would go to college because I was good in school and that was a natural thing to do. And I got scholarship offers from LSU and other universities. And it just seemed natural to me that you major in something that was um, practical and interesting. And to me, engineering and math and science were interesting and practical, and you could make a good career out of it. So to be honest, I mean, it's it wasn't back then like it is now where parents have these professional sort of guidance counselors and they take them around the country to tour colleges and uh, they, they have prep tests for the SAT and they have all this kind of systematic, extremely competitive way of doing it. Back then, it was more like, you know, you're a smart kid. You go you go you go to a college you get a scholarship at and you get a, you get a job and everything's fine. So I flipped through the LSU college uh, catalog trying to figure out my my major and i thought i liked computers so i chose electrical and computer engineering just for that reason it was very simple it wasn't systematic at all um so that's how i chose it and i studied uh, electrical engineering at lsu and i I loved it I, i loved all four years of it it was fascinating and uh i really did enjoy it um I did get a job offer with General Dynamics and another with Schlumberger, I think, right out of my BSEE degree. But I, I wasn't re- quite ready to join the workforce yet. Um, and my wife, my girlfriend then was still in school, so I decided to go to grad school just to kind of wait out the kind of quasi-recession and also to uh, just have more time to decide what to do and to maybe get a better offer. But I was always a little dissatisfied with the – uh, restricted nature of the sciences in, in engineering and in that it's all methodologically sort of mechanical and mathematical and they just shun all normative things, you know, history, philosophy, arguing, and those things fascinated me. So I kind of had a hunger for it and I started arguing and writing in libertarian type topics in the school newspaper and Everyone kept saying, you like to argue, you should go to law school. So I decided to look into law school. So that's how I ended up going to law school, just because my friends told me I like to argue and I thought I could make more money at it, which probably did turn out to be true. So, You know, my, my mother used to tell me that when I was young, I should go into law because I like to argue, but I, I don't think it was a compliment. Exactly. I don't know if it was for me either. And that's kind of it was in a way bad advice because they're thinking of litigators, right? Litigators are the ones that professionally argue for a living. And I'm not a litigator. I'm a transactional 
type attorney. I do uh, deals for people. I do transactional work, and uh, now I do IP work. Got a lot of questions related to this stuff I want to ask you, uh, but but first is um, just an observation. I came up about looks like I came up about uh, four years after you. Mm-hmm. Um, studied uh, in electrical engineering just like you did a master's degree just like you, mm-hmm. and I remember when I was coming out in '94. I remember all of the ads in the trade rags, uh, firms looking for electrical engineers to go to law school. Right. I do remember that. And so yes. that was, you were already in law school at that point, but I remember, uh, I remember contemplating it actually for a while. There seemed to be a huge demand for, for in, in, the, in, in the US especially for uh, scientific minded lawyers. Now, here, here's another observation. Uh, obviously when you're young, you're 17 years old, you really don't know what you want to do. You, you know, you have an idea of what you're good at. And it, it seems to me that the career chooses you as much as you choose the career because of the incentives that the market puts in place. Uh, you, you know, you want prestige, you want uh, to be a you know, high earner and whatnot. The market kind of puts that in place. And then you sort of match up your skills to the market. So the job kind of picks you. Do you think that's a good thing? I mean, you, you know, you probably don't regret going into engineering, but uh, what, what do you think about that, the market choosing you rather than you choosing the, the profession? Well, I think, I, I think, uh, I think, first of all, times have changed. It's my impression. I think that uh, when I come, I have an 11-year-old son now, 10, 11-year-old, and uh, w- when it comes time to advising on college and career choices for him, I think it's going to be a, a much more um, systematic and maybe agonizing process than when I was younger. Um, I do think that in our system, uh, both 10, 20, 30 years ago and now, if you are generally intelligent and competent and hardworking and have the right values, then it's not like there's just one thing that you're suited for. I think you're suited for a whole lot of things. So in a way, the, the, the problem is an embarrassment of riches. I mean you, you need to narrow your choice down and make a decision at some point. I think what narrows your choices down is the choices you make. So if you choose A over B in your, in your, in your, in your uh, major in college or if you choose your first job in this or that – then that's what starts narrowing down your future choices. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but of course the market helps guide intelligent you know, allocation of human capital and resources. You get these market signals. Um, in my case, and I don't know if it's that unusual, although I think it's probably not the majority experience, I was just from lower middle class, uh, rural Louisiana, but I was smart and did well in school, and I had decent parents who – recognized that and gave me the educational opportunities to sort of keep building on that. So to my mind, from my generation and my experience, the most crucial thing was just coming from a background where, number one, you're optimistic uh, and you have support, and it's never even a question that you're going to make it somehow. So I, I wasn't like 7 or 10 or 12 thinking what I'm going to be when I'm 30 or 40. I just assumed it was just a given for me, like a metaphysical given of the universe. I just assumed I would find a way and I would conquer it and I would do really well. And then I kept getting reinforcement of that sort of attitude because I would do well on tests and do had a, a, a support of family experience and everything. And then you got accepted into the college I wanted to and then make good grades and then you get job offers. And so everything sort of seems to reinforce that. Now, part of that is the luck of the time, the luck of circumstances. But the, the the lesson I got from that is it's important for young young kids to have it feel like they have an open ended field to explore, and to feel confident in themselves that they can do whatever they want within you know within certain bounds. You know, if you want to be a Romanian translator, if you're not good with languages or you never learn Romanian, that you should rule that one out. <laughs> you know, or if you want to be a basketball player and you're five foot two, maybe you should rule that one out. Yeah, I did. But Exactly. But other than that, I think that as long as you have an optimistic attitude and you think you can conquer the world, and not like in a ruthless, savage way, but just in in an optimistic way that you're going to succeed in whatever you want to do, Um, and then you're you're willing to realize you have to do things to achieve that. Like it's not just going to fall in your lap either. You have to work systematically at it. You have to have a plan. Uh, There are certain prerequisites. You know, if you want to be a doctor, you need to go to medical school. If you want to go to medical school, you have to have certain prerequisites ahead of time, I assume, um, et cetera. So that's kind of my take on 
on on the way things are. I, I uh, but I do think you should also be adaptive. And I, the most successful people I've seen in my life in my career have have been very adaptive. They adapt and they change when they sense that there's an opportunity out there that they're actually good at. They didn't know. Okay, I'm going to ask you to put your your kind of Monday through Friday hat on. So forget about being an, an academic thinker for a second. And so say I come to you, and uh, I'm an online entrepreneur. So I got this company. Uh, I'm going to market something, and uh, I want to pick a do- domain name. Should I worry about uh, using domain names that have words that are trademarked? I- is that a potential problem? Yes, yes, you should worry. That that's a problem. Um, so um, the reason is because of another type of IP law called trademark law, and and the way it's wormed its way into international law and internet law. Which, by which I mean, if you have a domain name, a certain type of domain name, um, that is basically a famous mark or someone's name. Like I said, let's say you had TomCruise.com you know, or Madonna.com. Okay. Now, the woman named Madonna doesn't own the word Madonna, but she's so famous and she has so much money, and her mark is so recognizable that if you had a, a website called Madonna.com, which just means mother, I think, right? I mean. Maybe you want to use it to sell something related to being a mother. I don't know. Yeah. There, there's a good chance she could go to the uh, the WIPO World Internet Property Property World Intellectual Property Organization, and she could use the UDRP proceeding, Un- Uniform Dispute uh, D- Domain Name Dispute. I forgot what it's called. Anyways, it's a, it's a way of resolving disputes about domain names on the internet. But it's a way, basically, of taking someone's domain from them. Because of a, a trademark complaint, even if no one is really defrauded, okay, and even if there's really not anything wrong with the original person's use, so it, it it allows people to be bullies. I mean, look, even Ron Paul, the Ron Paul campaign tried to stop someone who had RonPaul.com or something like that in the UDRP proceedings about a year ago, uh, which was pretty disheartening and pretty sad. Um, to see people using these things as weapons against their supporters and peaceful individual people. But the reality is, yes, if you're a businessman, you need to – when you just as when you select your business name, you need to be careful when you select your domain name. You need to talk to a trademark lawyer basically to say, make sure that uh, there's no risk in using this name. Um, or if you use it, understand that you might have it taken away from you. You might have to switch to another. So maybe that's a reason to have two or three backup domains, right? Um, and this search would have to be international? Well – Ten years ago, I would have said the USPTO website is good enough, um, the United States website. But nowadays, of course, a domain is usually meant to be a domain accessible anywhere in the world, and usually there's international and online commerce implications. So, yeah, you would need to do a WIPO search. You need to do a full search, and um, it can be difficult. I mean I think like even Apple or one of these famous companies lost its trademark in Mexico or somewhere recently because – you know, even even with a w- well-staffed legal department, it's hard to make sure that you have all your rights tied up around the world. There, there was the um, on on a slightly related note. You remember the uh, what's the, uh, the team with the uh, American Indian? Um, the, yeah, the, 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 the Redskins. The Redskins and the, the patent, the trademark office is is saying that their their mark is invalid because it's insensitive or offensive or something like that. Right. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen on appeal. I suspect that they will get their mark back. But in a way, most people don't realize they're not really harmed by losing the trademark because they can still use the mark. It just means they they don't have the exclusive right to use it. Yeah. So they can still call themselves the Redskins. It's not like illegal to say I'm the Redskins team. It's just that they don't they can't go to the government courts and sue people who are selling Redskins t-shirts now. Yeah, which means there's going to be more of them. Exactly. So, so the, the, the trademark office, by condemning the trademark, is going to make it more prevalent <laughs> in yeah. use. Yeah, yeah. Because they're they're easing that. restrictions. Uh, unless the uh, unless the NFL um, has a rule that says if your if your team name loses trademark uh, trademark protection, you have to change it to a, one that's trademarkable. Ah, they might. Yeah, they might. They, they might. So yeah, they, yeah. They, they may force them to just because they want to have a name that they can enforce monopoly state restrictions on. So they might switch to another name just for that. But the point is, 
the USPTO trademark office denying them a trademark doesn't mean they can't use the name. Most people don't realize that. Right, right, they can right. use it. In fact, anyone can use it now. It's yeah. just not a trademark. Right, right. Okay, so let's forget trademarks for a second. Say you have a domain name that's really cool, uh, for instance, like powerandmarket.com, uh, mm -hmm. and, but it, the, you know, the term might be copyrighted or something like that. Is that a concern? Okay, so l let's, let's talk about it. Copyright, trademark, and patent, and trade secret are the four big types of IP. Um, patent has to do with inventions, basically, so this has nothing to do with patents, okay? Trademark has to do with an, a, a mark or a word that serves as an identification of the source of a good, which is really what these domain name things are about. Copyright is a, an original expression of an idea, and typically copyright does not apply to a very, very short title. Like, like let's say the title of a book, like the word Titanic. You know, There's a movie called Titanic. That doesn't mean you can't write a novel tomorrow called Titanic, even if, it's about, even if it's about something nothing to do with the original Titanic disaster. Let's say you write a science fiction novel called Titanic that has to do with some huge asteroid hurtling towards the Earth. You could do that. It would not be a trademark uh, – sorry, it wouldn't be a copyright violation because titles are too short to get copyright protection. They're not original enough. Okay, So if you have powerandmarket.com, it's probably it's – not a tra it's not a patent issue for sure. It's not a trade secret issue because it's not secret, and it's not a copyright issue because it's too short. So really the only question is, is there a trademark out there? Typically, a trademark registered in the U.S. system, okay? Again, that's USPTO.gov, and you look for the TESS, the trademark search engine, T-E-S-S. -S. You can just do a search for a, for a word mark. Like you could search for power and market and see if that's registered already. If someone has a registration for power and market already, um, and if it covers the same services that you're doing, then you could have a problem. If not, then you're probably free and clear. Okay. Which is one reason why you would have an incentive to file your own trademark registration to preempt anyone from monopolizing that name now. So this is the problem with the patent, copyright, and trademark system is it gives people an incentive to have to hire legal advisors to acquire protection for them that they really don't want or need or they wouldn't want or need in a free market right? just to have freedom of action, to have clearance. Uh, and this is why patent attorneys and trademark lawyers and copyright lawyers make money. We're basically paid um, to help you know, grease the gears of the system for people, J just like tax lawyers wouldn't exist in a free market economy. You wouldn't have the whole class of tax attorneys or CPAs. But given the existence of the tax law, you need CPAs, and given the existence of the tax laws… They do, they do a heroic service by helping people navigate the system and reduce their tax burden. But it does amount to an incredible waste of resources. Yes. All the fees that are paid to patent lawyers, trademark lawyers, tax attorneys, CPAs, um, etc. I mean, look, you could say the same thing about a, an oncologist, a cancer doctor. It's like, well, we wish there wasn't cancer. Right, But so long as there's cancer, we need to pay oncologists a salary to try to solve this and treat this and respond to this problem. But in our ideal world, there wouldn't be cancer, and there would be no oncologist. In an ideal world, there wouldn't be taxes or patents, and you wouldn't have patent lawyers or tax lawyers or CPAs. Yeah, And we would all have yeah, – yeah. It's funny because you, you compared uh, oncologists with, for instance, tax attorneys, but at the same time, you're basically – Comparing cancer with <laughs> the law and government, it's kind of going to go hand in hand. Not law. I wouldn't say with law, but I know. IP I, law. I am, yeah, I'm yeah. comparing them because they're both bad things. Yeah, cancer, yeah. cancer is a bad thing for human life, and tax law and um, patent law are cancers on the free market economy I'm i mean with you, the, the, yeah so yeah that, there is a comparison you're yeah. right to notice that yeah um so getting back to my last question though so um power market is not under trademark you're thinking i should probably consider trademarking it and i shouldn't worry about getting a call from lou rockwell's attorneys is that an accurate summary of that uh, of, of that? <laughs> uh oh, okay well first of all um 
um, uh, how do you know it's, how do you know it's not on a trademark? Why well, I, I checked. I did the thing that you recommended. I did that when I got the domain. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, what about Lou Rock? Are you saying it, it resembles the, the Rothbard title? Is that what you're saying? It, it is the Rothbard title, isn't it? That's right. Power and market. But but that's that, like I said, that's a copyright right. issue. So, so I don't have to worry about Copyright is there's no copyright in titles, and I. I doubt there's a trademark, and I don't think that power and market has been used in commerce as a mark to identify – to serve as a source, the identifier of goods or services. I mean I'm not aware of power and market being used out there. Okay. In fact, I'm not sure if you're doing it. Um, you'd have to see. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, but but you, you, could, you could consider it. I think look, my, my, my uh, informal legal advice is the risk is low to you yeah, from okay. what I know. Yeah. But yes, it would. It, 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 there would be some reason for you to consider filing a trademark registration application on Power and Market uh, for the field of uh, services related to delivery of information on the radio or the internet in a podcast, thing okay. like that. Everyone I have on the program, I want to get some type of life hack or productivity tool. And you run your own law practice, so you must rely on a lot of. Uh, you know, online tools, apps, or whatever. Do you have something that you want to share with the audience? Something that would help out a home, a home-based business, or something? I think I can. Oh, this is a radical change of subject or topic, but um, <laughs> one of them is, is, is J2.com, and I, I mention this because I use it. I use it every day for the last ten years. It's J2.com. It's basically a an online fax service. And I, I hate fax. I hate that it's still, it's still around. But if you need to fax things, you can do it or receive faxes. You can do it through j2.com. So I would recommend that. Um, um, you know, I think there's free versions. There's professional versions. I mean I've been using this for a long time because there are some agents. So you can – if you have a document you need to fax in somewhere, you can just go to your Gmail and email it to um, – Fax number at j2send.com, and this is correlated with your account. So I've, I've loved this service. It's been really helpful that is really for cool. 10 years. Is it expensive? I don't think it's uh, – I think – like I said, I think there's a free version and there's a paid version. Even the paid version is not that much. Um, and then the other is something I've used for a few years now called SugarSync, S-U-G-A-R-S-Y-N-C.com. Um, and it's a paid service, but it basically synchronizes – folders on your computers mac ipad windows machines to a cloud account too um and so basically it keeps if you have multiple computers like a desktop and a laptop or two laptops or whatever it keeps them all in sync so if you modify a file like let's say a doc file in a certain folder on your computer then that change is instantly propagated to the cloud and to the other devices that are sharing that that folder it's sort of like Dropbox, but you pay a little bit for it. But from what I can tell, it works a lot better than Dropbox. So SugarSync and J2.com have been um, amazing resources for me. And plus, I use Carbonite as, a, as an online backup. Um, so those are pretty mundane, but uh, those are things that help me in my daily uh, practice. All right. That's exactly what I was after. Thank you for that. And uh, so if someone wants to contact you about a trademark issue or other IP issue um what's the best way to get in touch with you just go to stephankinsella.com and they can find my email address s-t-e-p-h-a-n not not steven which is an e the p-h-a-n-k-i-n-s-e-l-l-a.com and uh my email is on the contact page there and i'd be happy to talk i'm on facebook at ns kinsella i'm on skype at ns kinsella N is my first name, Norman. I go, I go by Stefan, but uh, it's N.S. Kinsella. I'm N.S. Kinsella everywhere, basically. Okay, great. All right, so uh, let's wrap it here. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I could go on and on with you, actually. I have a whole list of things that I want to talk to you about. We'll have to do that another time. Uh, but thank you so much. It's an hour and a half discussion, and it just flew by. So th- thank you so much for that. M- maybe we'll do part two in person. That'd be nice. <laughs> My thanks to Stefan Kinsella for joining me today. You can find him at stefankinsella.com. If you'd like to hear the rest of this interview, go to powerandmarket.com slash bonus, where you'll find free bonus content each week. And that's the Power and Market Report for Tuesday, July 29th. I'm Albert Liu. Thanks for listening.